Episode 1 of Beyond Evil begins with Dong Sik out in the fields with his colleague. Shining a flashlight, he calls out in fear as Dong Sik races over to investigate. Buried in the ground are two skeletal hands clasped together, belonging to a murder victim. We then cut back to the 14th October 2000 as a young woman named Yu Yin plays the piano in church. Her twin brother is actually Dong Sik. He's busy playing guitar at a live cafe though, but he's called out for singing out of tune and scaring off the customers. To make matters worse, he's told that his sister will always outshine him. While he leaves, Yu Yin receives a message from someone telling her to meet outside. In the middle of the night, she creeps off down a long pathway. Isolated, it turns out she's not alone as strange screaming picks up from a distance. All the lights shut off, prompting her to hurry off down the road. Night turns to day and the camera pans across this field to show the girl tied down with pink ribbons around her ankles and wrists. Back home, her mother heads outside to pick up the paper. Only, she finds all of Yu Yin's fingers laid out on the side. It's a grim opening, and one that immediately introduces us to Dream City Manju. Time passes, 20 years to be precise, and Dong Sik is now a police officer. He's called to the scene of a game of Go, Stop, finding himself pulled about by the various different women. Eventually Dong Sik snaps, and decides to arrest them all for gambling and betting. The officers at the station aren't exactly happy, especially as this means clocking in extra hours after their shift. While all the officers bicker and try to convince Dong Sik otherwise, a new man arrives at the scene. Complete with a flashy car and a positive attitude, Inspector Han Ju Wan prepares to work after having been transferred to this law firm. He's early too, although Station Chief Ying Chiu Man is having trouble with his computer. The other officers begin to discuss the newbie's arrival, including how his father is actually the superintendent back at the head office. Ju Wan catches a glimpse of Dong Sik's know-how and make a reference of his impressive knowledge regarding the law. He's pretty impressed, although he remains silent while leaving that day. Ju Wan heads off to visit his father who warns him that he needs to lay a low given what's happened in the past. The next day, Ju Wan arrives and speaks to Dong Sik as the pair officially introduce themselves to each other. Only, he rejects Dong Sik's handshake, claiming he doesn't like physical contact. Inside the station tensions continue as Ju Wan calls Dong Sik a nutcase. Chief Nam decides to team them up to make them start liking one another. Begrudgingly, the pair head out on patrol together, with Ju Wan disapprovingly wiping down the surfaces with wet wipes. The pair immediately start bickering, with Dong Sik taking personal reports on his phone. This first report comes in the form of Bang Wu Chiu, he's a 74-year-old with advanced dementia. Together, they find Mr. Bang out in the fields. Unfortunately, Ju Wan introduces himself as a police officer, and it caused Mr. Bang to begin freaking out. Together, the pair hold the man down, and bring him back home. Dong Sik and Ju Wan head back to the office, where they clean themselves up. There, they tease the newbie and claim he has mysophobia, which is a fear of germs. Despite his reservations and hesitation, Ju Wan shows up at the team meal at Manyang Butcher's shop, where Jie Yi happens to be. Together, they discuss Ju Wan's father and his rank. This inevitably makes Ju Wan feel uncomfortable, leading to him heading outside alone to get some air. When he does though, he spies Dong Sik in the room next door cutting meat. Dong Sik admits to liking the kid, but watches him leave suspiciously. That evening, Ju Wan meets his live in tutor who classes himself as part of their family. This man is Prosecutor Kwan Hayok. He hands over a file for him, something he's told to fix up in exchange for help. This brings Ju Wan back to his apartment, where he happens to have a whole massive file on the serial murders gripping this region. We then cut back nine months ago with Ju Wan leading the charge at work regarding the various different victims, all of which showing the bodies lying in a similar way. Dong Sik is in the firing line for this, unable to explain how his partner died, and consequently causing his whole team to being demoted. Dong Sik was also the one person suspected of being the murderer too, but something doesn't quite add up. Anyway, the next day Dong Sik receives a call regarding Mr. Bang, who has gone missing again. This catches us up to the moments at the start of the episode as a body has found in the fields, complete with a gold ring. Ju Wan seems to know who this is, and as he staggers away Dong Sik catches a glimpse of this. Before they can investigate further, Ju Wan asks outright whether Dong Sik killed his sister. A strange creepy smile crosses his face as the episode comes to a close. Episode 2 of Beyond Evil starts us off back at the crime scene again as forensics arrive. With no security cameras in the reed fields, it's a blind spot and still unknown exactly who's responsible for this. 
Senior Officer Lin starts to guide the different officers, discussing exactly which part of the mud they need to look at and begin excavating. As they start, the group notice pink ribbon tied around the legs, which links to the murders in the past too. Predictably, this cuts us back to the 15th October 2000 as Dong Sik is arrested. Apparently officers found evidence at the crime scene linked to him. Despite telling his father he's innocent, Dong Sik is taken away. Only, it turns out the fingers found before actually didn't belong to Yu Yin as they didn't have the same nails. Back in the present, Dong Sik plays Ju Won at his own game, and decides to allow a background check on himself. In fact, while he's sat in the interview room he tells his colleague that he's going to be investigated and cooperate with the search. Dong Sik too is suspicious of his colleague, calling out Ju Won for his reaction towards seeing the dead body. Oh Jai Hua shows up and immediately starts questioning them both, especially as they were the pair who first found with the body. First up, she reads Ju Won's statement, which includes Jai Han screaming and being the one to call them over. She's pretty nonchalant about the whole affair, not asking many probing questions and promising to write up this report shortly. Chief Nam arrives to reprimand them both, though as they leave the place. He confronts Dong Sik, but stops mid-sentence. This only fuels Ju Won's suspicion as they head out for food together. He begrudgingly sticks with his partner, especially as Dong Sik slurps the meat broth hungrily. The next day, Dong Sik visits the nursing home, where his mother happens to be. She's asleep though, but sitting on the seat next to her is Jin Muk who thanks him, while stuttering and struggling with his mental condition. Meanwhile, the autopsy report for the body comes back. Apparently it's about 8 months old, and the shoes are a big talking point. Given the bodies were wrapped in a black bag with a pink ribbon, the way it was wrapped indicates a very deliberate killer who used this as a form of present. As we cut across to Dong Sik and Ju Won, the plot thickens. The former helps change Siak Gai's shoes carefully, while out in the ring. Dong Sik promises to phone his mother, but while Ju Won is away making the call, he catches Dong Sik grinning maniacally again, while Siak Gu dances under his umbrella. That evening, Dong Sik attends another team meeting where they discuss the case. Given its similarities to what happened 20 years ago, it seems like the same killer is on the loose. While they talk about the implication of this over drinks, Ju Won instead speaks to his father about the same case, and believes they could even be dealing with a copycat killer. He questions just why the superintendent closed the case before, but instead is met with a frosty reply, and a warning to stop prying into this. Ju Won is told to keep quiet about the victim as we are left with more questions than answers. These questions manifest with Ju Won heading into the station to find the case files. Only the archives are missing. Given the police moved buildings and a fire broke out previously, deliberately perhaps, some of these files may have been completely lost. Ju Won is not happy, especially with the nonchalant attitude toward these files, and instead decides to change his approach slightly. This time, he goes after the officer in charge at the time, Assistant Inspector Nam Sang Bei. He just so happens to be the chief in charge of Nanyang Police Substation. Ju Won approaches Nam and mentions how he's connected to the cases in the past and asks him outright about Dong Sik. Ju Won is curious, especially over why he silenced the restaurant owner before. Nam tells Ju Won that Dong Sik is erratic and clearly grief stricken. Following the incident with his sister, he's not of sane mind. To make matters worse, Dong Sik's father died too, and Dong Sik was nowhere to be found at the time. Given the grief and trauma surrounding him, Nam warns Ju Won not to go after him. Interestingly, Dong Sik too is doing some investigate work of his own. Specifically, he looks into Ju Won's transfer across to their substation and the reasons behind it. After, he rings Jai Hua and requests she phone his informant to try and get more information. While she's not particularly thrilled at the idea, Dong Sik next heads off to see Min Yun at the club, making a big scene and calling out the man with her in front of everyone. Given the VIP room booked, and the vulnerable way Min Yun is passed out on the sofa, Dong Sik threatens him, and takes the girl back to the station. In the morning, Min Yun wakes up drunk and makes a big scene at the station. That is, until Dong Sik shows and immediately tells her to sober up, or she won't go anywhere. Ju Won isn't comfortable with this treatment but keeps quiet. While out on patrol though, he learns more about Jin Muk, and specifically his role in all this. Jin Muk was taken in his family by Dong Sik and his parents. Now that they're gone, Dong Sik essentially plays the role of mother and father to this man. Back at the station, Min Yun sneaks out and starts heading home. That is, of course, the absolute worst thing she could do. A smile crosses her face, as if she knows the assailant, as the next scene shows her tied up on the ground. 
The police team, though remain unaware of this, waiting for her, will at the butcher shop having another team meal. Chief Nam leads the charge, and toasts them all toward finding the man, or woman, responsible and bringing them to justice. While they drink, Dong Sik is deep in thought. Specifically, he's thinking about the missing files from work. Well, these files weren't burnt after all. As Dong Sik heads into his basement, he happens to have them all up across the wall in a tapestry of questions that remain unanswered. In the morning, Ju Wan shows up at Dong Sik's house, ready to investigate the local area. Specifically, he wants to get a better understanding of the area. Dong Sik sees through this, though and eventually the two end up in a standoff. Dong Sik suddenly changes his cool and calm demeanor and starts sobbing. On the table nearby are ten fingers, all cut off and severed. These belong to Min Yun, as we soon see, as Ju Wan watches his colleague sob incredulously at what's happened. Only, the final scene of the episode cuts back in time, to show the identity of the man in a black hooded jacket. It's Dong Sik. What could this mean? Episode 3 of Beyond Evil begins with Chief Nam speaking to Jin Muk, trying to reassure him after Min Yun's fingers were found at the crime scene. Jin Muk, however, continues to mention how he lined everything up. This could be a crucial clue, so we'll stick with that. Meanwhile, various different officers at the station, and Yu Jie at the butcher shop, find themselves struggling with this news. Among those is Ju Wan, who receives a message from Jai Hua telling him to be at the station by 3 p.m. for questioning. Dong Sik heads back to the archives, and tells Ying to leave. After ripping down all the files from the basement wall, he heads back to check the different boxes. As he does, Ying ignores Dong Sik's request, and approaches him in the archives. He asks Dong Sik about Min Yun, and whether he's the one responsible for what happened to her. As they talk, Ju Wan happens to be listening from around the corner. He's immediately distracted, though by a message from Jai Hua telling him she's waiting. Dong Sik shows up too, as the issues in the statement recording room are tense affair. Ju Wan warns his colleague not to get so emotional, but Dong Sik brushes this off, asking outright just why that's such a bad thing. Just then though, Detective Kang Du Su shows up and sits in, watching this interview take place. Dong Sik has an alibi until 11 p.m. on the night in question. He left the substation around that time with Jai Hua. Ju Wan isn't comfortable with this, especially given the intimate closeness between the detectives. He likens the two family, and believes none of them would actually rat out their own. He's particularly suspicious of Dong Sik, being the first one to find both victims, both now and 20 years ago. Dong Sik chuckles incredulously, and turns it around to him, when Ju Wan tries to leave the room. He challenges the man, staring him in the face, while asking Jai Hua, whether Ju Wan has an alibi for the night in question. He mentions how Ju Wan is an outsider there, and has inside information to the case. Dong Sik even brings up the archive files and questions, whether Ju Wan may be a copycat killer to what happened in the past. Ju Wan, as it turns out, doesn't have an alibi between 7pm and the following day. He simply went home into sleep, but because no one can verify, but then it seems suspicious. While he sits in this interview, we cut across to a conversation between Ju Wan and his father, where he asks the superintendent to get him the camera footage from inside the police station archives. Back home, Dong Sik begins wiping down his basement, including throwing bleach on the floor and cleaning the wooden workbench. This happens to have a spatter of blood on it, but Dong Sik continues to clean it sloppily without batting an eyelid. Is he really the killer? Well, a knock at the door brings Jai Hua over to Dong Sik's place, where they discuss the cases and what happened to Yu Yin. With no word on the girl without fingertips, Dong Sik deduces that she's already dead and searching is futile. On top of that, they also believe Min Ying too is dead, and whoever the culprit is, they won't let the body go. Outside, Jai Hua and Yun Zhe discuss this unnerving statement and wonder whether Dong Sik is actually hiding something. Jai Hua admits that she was never suspicious of Dong Sik in the past. Twenty years ago she was always convinced Dong Sik was innocent, and asks Yun Zhe whether he felt the same. Although H agrees with her, something about the way he says it seems to be suspicious. Is he hiding something? Remember the lady with the gold ring? Well, it turns out Ju Wan was actually in collusion with this woman, whose name is Li Junghua. Finding out she's an illegal immigrant, Ju Wan installed a location tracker on her phone, and essentially forced her to keep tabs on Dong Sik, to work out exactly what he's doing. On the day of Li Junghua's disappearance, Ju Wan received a message from her number, saying hello with a series of ones and a link to something. 
Back in the present, Ju Won checks his email and finds a video for the police station showing both the archive files and a few different officers coming and going. At the same time though, detectives start combing the forest where they find his cell phone. Yu Won heads into the archives and finds all the missing files from before. Yu Yin's case is back and he believes Dong Sik put them there. As Ju Won chuckles, he turns to Ying Xia and asks whether he's Dong Sik's accomplice. As we soon see from flashes to the past, this isn't the first time Ying Xia has been accused of this. When he leaves, Ying Xia rings Dong Sik to let him know. This soon changes Dong Sik's mind about leaving the force for a while, instead heading out on patrol with Ju Won again. Only this time, Ju Won tells him he's going to drive. Together, they head into town, where Ju Won asks him about the case files. However, they're both interrupted by a call from Jai Hua asking him to head back to the station. There, he's brought into the interrogation room again, where Jai Hua mentions the phone and specifically the text messages sent to him. When the chief superintendent finds out, he's irate and demands a DNA examination to be sure this is correct. His choice words about ringing, if something shows up seems to hint that there are secrets being held, but who's telling the truth and who's lying here? At the police station, Councilwoman Du shows up and speaks to the different officers. She makes Ying Zhe uncomfortable, especially given this woman happens to be his mother. As he escorts her outside, he mentions Chang Jin and warns her never to join hands with him. As we soon see, Chang Jin is actually a chairman and used to be married to none other than Jai Hua. It seems everyone is connected in this drama. That evening, Quan Hayak meets Ju Wen and feeds back the details surrounding the phone. He hands over the file and confirms that Jun Hua's DNA was found on it. This will, unfortunately, link straight back to Ju Wen. The rookie detective remains cool-headed though, claiming it's all circumstantial. His father, when he finds out, is not happy and berates his son for the foolishness surrounding this case. Ju Wen returns to the police station in the morning and decides to take a leave of absence. On top of that, he also apologizes to Dong Sik and walks away. Dong Sik follows and thanks him. When he does, he bows and suddenly begins laughing under his breath. Dong Sik suddenly snaps though, turning back to his straight-faced demeanor. Ju Wen grabs him by the scruff of the neck, calling him out for mocking him, but Dong Sik seems puzzled over what's just happened. Dong Sik shows him the camera and encourages him to stop. This eventually sees Ju Wen head to Mount Simju, where the phone was initially found. He finds tire tracks and, more tellingly, dashcam footage that could be crucial to this investigation. Using his laptop, Ju Wen finds Dong Sik grinning maniacally and walking away from the house. Thus leads Ju Wen up to the house we saw Dong Sik at earlier in the episode, including the bloodstained workbench and the posters up on the wall. Despite a camera being installed, Dong Sik is arrested for the abduction and killing of Min Yun. When he leaves, a smile crosses his lips in the police car. It also seems like a smile crosses Ju Wen's lips. Episode 4 of Beyond Evil begins with the police investigating this warehouse, while Dong Sik sits in the back of a police car awaiting his fate. While he does, trouble brews at the police station as news of Dong Sik's arrest breaks. Someone seems to have leaked this information. The violent crimes department catch wind and happen to be the ones to hastily arrest the man. With reporters desperate to catch a glimpse of him, Jai Hua tries to bring Dong Sik in while avoiding suspicions. Dong Sik, however, removes his blanket to show the reporters that they've all arrested a police officer. That same creepy smile crosses his face as Jai Hua scrambles to take him down to the basement. Meanwhile, Ju Wen heads up to Munju Police Station and wants to watch Dong Sik's interview. He simply mentions Lieutenant Han and specifically his phone. After though, he mentions noodles in a black bag he was holding. Knowing that it's illegal to light these up in the mountains, he matter of zero factly claims to have eaten these raw. Ju Wen believes all of this is a big show, as Dong Sik admits that the police will come under fire for arresting Dong Sik without a warrant. He continued to repeat the same mantra about noodles, claiming he went hiking to clear his head, something that doesn't deviate from his usual routine. Jai Hua brings up the blood found in his basement and how it belongs to Min Yun. Specifically, she mentions the bleach situation and why it was found in his basement. Dong Sik hits back though, claiming that even using bleach like that would have left residue of blood around. The subject of the security camera is a curious thing too, especially as Dong Sik installed it before thoroughly cleaning the basement. But yet, why leave just one drop of blood on this side? Something clearly doesn't add up here. Ju Wen deliberates over these facts and believes Dong Sik may have chopped off Min Yun's fingers elsewhere before transporting her. Specifically, at the butchers. 
the search warrant is issued and police swarm the area. On the back of this, Ju Won finds himself pelted with eggs by Jae Yi, he's obvious not happy about her shop being searched. She claims Dong Sik is innocent, and that Ju Won is doing all of this just to put a show on. Just before he leaves, Ju Won tells her that he'll figure out all the secrets being held, even if that means investigating her too. At the substation, Ju Won returns and starts washing the egg off his uniform. While he does, Chief Nam shows and confirms that he's not approved his leave of absence and as such, needs to continue working. Outside, Jai Hoon hoses down Ju Won's car for him. He claims there's something he doesn't know and immediately snaps. He coldly mentions how he's messed with people in this town that are stuck here. There's something pretty unnerving with the way he says this before snapping back to his cheery, innocent demeanor. We'll have to wait and see if he's actually a suspect or not. The blood sample from Dong Sik's workbench comes back, and it turns out the DNA doesn't match Min Yung's. Because of this and Ju Won's hastiness to arrest him the police force have been disgraced. Kwon Hyok berates Ju Won's foolishness too, admitting that he's going to help clean this up with the superintendent. When he walks away, a wry smile crosses his lips. Oh no, is this another possible suspect? The list continues to grow. The blood in question happens to belong to a woman named Han jiong -in. This same person is on a missing person poster up at Dong Six basement and has a number correlating to the butcher shop. This, as we soon see, confirms that Jae Yi has a personal stake in this ongoing serial case. Ju Won heads in to see Dong Sik at the station and deduces that he gets closer to his victims before killing them. There is, of course, no evidence of this, but Ju Won remains determined to follow this lead through. When he leaves, Jin Muk arrives to see Dong Sik a prison with food for him. He tells Jin Muk not to skip his meals and to sleep well, eventually leaving to head back to his cell. On the back of this, and a petition asking for Dong Sik to be released, Jai Hua leads the charge and asks the station chief Ying Chilman to let him go. Ying Zhe suddenly shows up and claims he made a mistake. He confirms that the night Min Yun went missing Dong Sik was actually with him, giving an alibi to Dong Sik's actions. Jai Hua takes him aside though, and asks just what he's doing. Well, aside from being his best friend, he suspects he would have heard the front door squeak open, given how loud it is. Jai Hua is not sure this is a good idea, claiming he's doing the same now as he did 20 years back. Meanwhile, Councilwoman Du, Superintendent Han and Chairman Chang Jin all discuss the case. Specifically, Chang Jin wants Munju police to help with his upcoming development project. In doing so, this could take the attention away from the current developments with the police. That evening, Dong Sik is released thanks to Ying Zhe's statement. Ju Wen keeps tabs on him though, as Dong Sik shows at the restaurant and immediately finds himself berated by the restaurant owner. She throws salt on him and tells the man to leave. Nonchalantly, Dong Sik walks away. He even chuckles to an action that Ju Wen sees and wonders just what he's doing. When Dong Sik eventually arrives at the butcher's, he notices a police report break. Well, this news regarding Min Yun claims that she's an escort and notorious for sleeping with clients. Various different people have statement relating to her too, prompting Dong Sik to suddenly burst into maniacal laughter. The others are pretty surprised by this outburst, but so too is Ju Wen who follows Dong Sik back home and listens as he starts apologizing and weeping. Dong Sik knows Ju Wen has snuck inside though, and encourages him to show his face. Honestly, how many times has Ju Wen just wandered into his house? Anyway, Ju Wen holds a gun to Dong Sik's head and asks him about the murders. Dong Sik shrugs this thread off, telling him that anything said under duress won't hold up in court. Besides, he has a solid alibi. Dong Sik turns the conversation around though and calls Ju Wen out for the planted burner phone and using Li Jun Hua against him. Ju Wen walks out, shocked and trying to comprehend what he's just heard. Well, Ju Wen eventually heads on TV and claims that they have a serial murderer on their hands. After this public statement, Ju Won heads back to see Dong Sik and asks about his words from before. Specifically, Ju Won centers on Dong Sik telling him he doesn't want to know who the killer is. This seems to hint that Dong Sik is protecting someone but who. Meanwhile, Jai Hua confronts Jai Hun back home with security camera footage from the internet cafe. It turns out he tipped off the police as he wanted Dong Sik to be a suspect. As we see flashes from that night, we see Jai Hoon walking toward Min Yun with a smile on his face. Is Jai Hoon the real? Episode 5 of Beyond Evil begins with Dong Sik learning Jum Jia's name and immediately turning the tables on his colleague. He knows who Ju Won hired to try and trick him. In response, Dong Sik brings up a list of other officers at the station who he could potentially be protecting. 
It's an incredibly chilling dialogue, one that sees Dong Sik chuckle as he turns on the news. The chief superintendent apologizes to the public for his son's words, bowing and taking responsibility for it. He claims that all of this was done without evidence, and essentially wipes his hands of any involvement with his son. He even promises to hold Ju Won accountable. However, it seems there's more than one motive for this, especially with the redevelopment project due to take place. That evening, Dong Sok heads back to the butchers and speaks to Ying Xia. He finds his colleague completely wasted and sketching a dough in silence. As Dong Sik sits and talks to him, Ying Xia mentions how he keeps hearing women's voices who call to him and ask for help. The next day, a reporter called Im Jairi Siok shows up at the police station and requests an interview with Ju Won. He refuses until Dong Sik shows and calls the reporter out for defamation. With all the officers together, they surround the reporter and ask for his card. Tay check his ID badge and eventually forbid the man from showing up at the substation. They manage to warn him off as Ju Won stands confused and wonders what this means. Dong Sik quickly explains that they're Manyang police and they protect each other. Only, these words hold a double meaning. On the one hand, it's good for stopping their enemies together. On the other, it could also mean these officers are covering for each other if one is a murderer. He's immediately interrupted, though by an enraged Dong Sik hurrying into the patrol car and racing downtown. With Ju Won in the car next to him, Dong Sik stops in town, where Jin Muk happens to be speaking publicly up on the podium in front of everyone. Dong Sik tells Ju Won to stay inside the car, while he heads up to stop Jin Muk. After, he confronts a woman in the crowd who claims that Min Ying isn't the same as her daughter given their characters are completely different. Dong Sik is enraged, and even more so, when he speaks to Councilwoman Du after. This official mentions how they suffered together 20 years ago. As we soon see, this is a direct result of her showing up at Dong Six and berating him for being let free from the police station and using Ying Xia. Eventually this bad blood spills over into a big brawl out by the stage. Ju Wen gets involved and helps his colleague. With them both seemingly on the same page for now, the officers call out Chang Jim and arrest him for instigating assault courtesy of his goons. With Ju Wen and Dong Sik also held in custody, the superintendent watches the footage of his son in a gang fight and struggles to compose himself. Unable to get through to Ju Wen, he instead rings Chang Jin. While they're on the phone together, both Dong Sik and Ju Wen are in the interrogation room again. Only, this time the dynamic is slightly different and less hostile. Jai Hua arrives and warns that, because they've ruined the event then it puts them in a tricky position going forward. Eventually Dong Sik caves and decides to take the deal in exchange for the videos being taken down from the internet. Out in the parking lot, Dong Sik and Ju Won come to blows over their changed ideologies. Dong Sik eventually leaves, popping pills in the back on the taxi as he heads home. Meanwhile, Ju Won meets his brother in the bar again, who gives him instructions to lay a low with a well-rehearsed scenario to cover their backs. Quan Hai Ya confirms that the audit office will handle this. Ju Wen eventually caves and asks Quan Hai Yak for help in investigating Ying Zhe's history and seeing what he could be hiding. After, Ju Wen heads home and starts cycling, thinking over Ying Zhe's past and whether he could be the big culprit here. Dong Sik speaks to the reporter and learns that someone tipped him off. That someone, as we know, is Jai Hoon, and he calls him out for it later that day. As they sit together, we cut back to that fateful night with Min Yun. Now, Jai Hoon was there but he wasn't the person she smiled at. She actually smiled at Yung Zhe who showed up to see her before him. Jai Hoon pleads his case with Dong Sik, telling him he's not a stalker, but didn't say anything before as this could have caused big problems for them. Later that evening, more about Yung Zhe is unveiled. Ju Wen has done his research and brings up an incident involving Jun Zhe in the past. Apparently he killed someone who looked like a doe. It seems like Dong Sik and the others have completely covered this up. Dong Sik loses his patience, asking Ju Wen outright, where his evidence is that links all of this together. There is none, of course, beyond the hunches that Ju Wen has. As the two stand face to face, Ju Wen admits everything about the sting operation and wants to catch the culprit and bring them to justice. We then cut back to the night with Min Yun, where Jin Muk happens to be standing, watching everything transpire from afar. Oh no, is this another suspect? Episode 6 of Beyond Evil begins with Jin Muk making food and showing up at the police station while counting. Jai Hua shows to greet him though, taking the kimchi from the man while he walks away. At the substation he does the same thing, dropping off kimchi for them and counting. Jai Hun struggles to hold back tears as Jin Muk leaves. 
It turns out his counting is actually due with the number of people he's met deliberating, hinting that he's trying to give himself an alibi over his actions. We then cut to October 23, 2020, the night Min Yun went missing. On the way home she was messaging Yingxia and told him she's going home. Jai Hoon apparently had some business to attend to after leaving the police station, while Dong Sik decided against finding Min Yun. In his pocket, however, are Min Yun's keys. He pops some pills and rings her, with the girl saved in his phone as Dong Sik's love forever. He reminds her she left the keys at the substation as she hangs up on him. Yingxia is there to greet her. He offers to take Min Yun home, while both Jin Muk and Jai Hoon happen to be there. Jin Muk overhears Min Yun calling him creepy and claiming he gives her goosebumps. He races off, hiding inside his shop as we cut to various different scenes of him tying Min Yun down and chopping. Whether this is just a vision or actually true though remains to be seen. Meanwhile, Dong Sik and Ju Won reconvene their conversation in the basement. Only, Jin Muk asks for Ju Won's phone number. Instead, Dong Sik hands the phone over to him. He wants to meet Ju Won, bringing them both over to his house to find out what's up. Jin Muk wants Ju Won to investigate the case, especially upon news that he's a really good detective. Although he agrees to do so, Dong Sik takes him aside and asks quite what he's doing. Dong Sik doesn't want him investigating for some reason, but Ju Won instead turns it around, believing that Jai Hua may have been the one Dong Sik is covering for. Furthermore, he also brings up the police station issue, including how the footage was erased during the times he had back in to drop off the files. Ju Won does eventually start investigating, taking Jin Muk's statement. It all becomes too much for Dong Sik though, who walks away. Ju Won uses this statement and starts to piece together what happened that night. It turns out Min Yun made it back home, but Jai Hoon arrived and knocked on the door, asking for her to show. Chief Nam too is looking about while Dong Sik seems to have intentionally missed off heading back to the store with Jin Muk. But why? Well, it seems like all of Min Yun's possessions are still in order save for a few seemingly unconnected items. A washcloth, towel and her cell phone are all missing. The investigation continues and Ju Won arrives to see Jae Yi, who also confirms these items were missing, given she usually tied the towel in a bow in the bathroom. After thanking her for help, Ju Won deliberates over key moments in this audio transcript, including Dong Sik asking about the missing item. Ying Zhe continues to crack, hearing voices and wondering what may be up with him. He remains convinced that Dong Sik isn't a culprit, but his mother cuts him off before he can tell her why. When Ying Zhe leaves, having been approved a period of absence by her, Chang Jin arrives out the shadows and asks that very same question, asking what he knows. However, Du demands he hand over the dashcam footage, hinting that he too is aware of what's happening here. There are secrets everywhere it seems. Ju Won continues to investigate, which leads him to Chief Nam yet again. The times he entered the security room seemed to correlate with him deleting the footage from the computers. After making sure Ju Won's phone isn't recording, he admits the truth. Dong Sik stole case documents from the record room that were over 20 years old relating to his sister's disappearance. Nam told him to replace them, and then deleted the footage. He apparently did so, to protect his junior officers. Ju Won though is not convinced this is the true version of events. It seems Nam is hiding something big, especially when Dong Sik too questions him in private, and tells the chief he never asked the man to delete the footage from the hallway and records room. At the police station, Jai Hua receives dashcam footage which is also leaked online too, incriminating Jai Hoon. Unfortunately this immediately sees the violent crimes division arrive to arrest him. While he's taken away, Dong Sik shows and tells Jai Hoon he should come clean and reveal everything that's happened. Dong Sik then rushes straight to the archives room, trying in vain to contact Ying Zhe. A very nervous Jai Hoon is interviewed, and he admits that Ying Zhe was the person who took Min Ying home that night. As everything starts to come unraveled, Chief Nam tells Jai Hua to take Dong Sik away. While they're sat eating dinner together with Jie Yi, Jin Muk shows up looking pretty suspicious. Dong Sik immediately heads outside, walking away from the butcher's shop. When he does, he looks down at something inside a chest of drawers during a point of view shot. Just like that, there's a ping on the phone. We then cut to Ju Won who suddenly receives that same update from Min Yun's phone. Ju Won charges up to the butchers, where Jin Muk happens to have received a message on his phone reading Dad, please let me out. This message was sent today, at 10.22pm. Episode 7 of Beyond Evil begins three years ago on November 21st, 2017. Dong Sik happens to be on a stakeout with Inspector Lee sang Yab. They discuss the various different victims, and how one of them happens to be his family member. 
Dong Sik is shot, believing Sang Yab to be a liability as they continue to try and catch a man named Jai Ho. In fact, Sang Yab even suggests they plant evidence. Dong Sik doesn't want to hear this and eventually tells him not to make a single move. Only, he absolutely does. Sang Yab leaves and races after Jai Ho, their suspect, who takes off down the road. Dong Sik follows in hot pursuit, where he finds bloodied clothes in a flaming bin. He also hears two gunshots too, as Sang Yab falls out the building and collapses on the ground. As he bleeds out, Dong Sik phones an ambulance, while his colleague tells him he needs to go after Jai Ho. And go after him he does. Dong Sik is blinded by rage and shoots the man, knocking him out the building and eventually putting handcuffs on him. As he does, Jai Ho smiles and tells Dong Sik all of this was self-defense. Dong Sik grabs the man's head and slams it repeatedly into the ground, grief-stricken as he looks over his dead colleague's body. Now we're back in the present as we see Dong Sik outside with Min Ying's phone. He was the one to write the text messages to Jin Muk. Heading back inside, he feigns surprise along with everyone else. We then cut back yet again to the day of Min Ying's disappearance, October 23, 2020. Jai Han rings Jin Muk after Min Ying returns home and tells him that she's there. When he locks the door, he also puts a padlock on it. Dong Sik happens to be out walking, talking to Jai Hua who wants him to head over and eat. Jai Han arrives at the supermarket, where Jin Muk has Min Ying tied down, ready to slice her fingers off. Dong Sik heads over too, but no one answers. Given he has Min Ying's keys, he sneaks in the back, but finds the place empty. In fact, he even finds the key to the padlock basement on the floor. Using the key, he heads down and finds the severed fingers all laid out on the side. Min Ying is gone, while Jin Muk is very much the culprit here. In fact, Dong Sik even rings him and asks where Min Ying is. He tells her she's sleeping like a dead person. It now seems like we found our killer. Dong Sik finds Min Ying's cell phone hidden in a Tupperware box deep in the kimchi Jin Muk has been making outside. This fabricating of evidence linked to the moments with Sang Yab early on are what drive Dong Sik to lie and actually find evidence to use against Jin Muk. He also takes the fingers too, laying them out in front of the supermarket in order to incriminate Jin Muk. Back in the present, Dong Sik and Ju Wan are told that Jin Muk remembered something from that night. As Dong Sik shows up, suspicion crosses his face as he looks at this man whom he believes is the killer. Jin Muk tells him Jie Yi doesn't have an alibi, and this brings them back over again. She confirms that she left for an hour on October 23rd, but head upstairs to her room in the attic. Meanwhile, Jai Hoon is free thanks to Yingzha turning himself in. He claims not to be innocent, especially being the last person to see Min Ying alive. Councilwoman Du is beside herself with rage, telling her son to stop being so stupid. Dong Sik shows up though, and tells Yingzha he's definitely not a suspect, thanks to the texts he's been sending. Just like that, another message comes in from Min Ying's phone. Dong Sik shows up at Jin Muk's house and eyes him suspiciously. On his way to head up and check the phone, Jie Yi happens to arrive first, replacing the phone with a map. Alone at the trial, he speaks to Jie Yi about Jin Muk and reveals that he's the serial murderer. In the morning, Ju Wan shows up with the warrant for Jie Yi's butcher shop. This time she's not so angry about it, although Ju Wan remains suspicious of her. In private, his investigation with Quan Hai Ya brings up nothing out the ordinary when he runs a background check on her. What does raise suspicions, however, is Ju Wan searching the CCTV footage from that night. This brings him to a utility pole, which just so happens to be overlooking the supermarket from a distance. The footage itself has been completely erased. Later that night, Jin Muk heads over to see Jie Yi at the butcher's shop. He fingers one of the knives on the table before eventually walking away. When he does, Jie Yi scrambles to shut the door. Only, he leaves behind a hairpin he stashed inside some meat. He tells her to follow him down to the reed field in a bit to free her mother. Jie Yi phones Dong Sik and tells her she's on her way to find her mother. As she mentions the reed fields, Jie Yi finds a gravestone. Meanwhile, Ju Wan heads up to Jin Muk's house where he and Dong Sik catch Jin Muk checking bags full of different items in the ground. Ju Wan brandishes some handcuffs and tells Jin Muk his life is completely finished. Episode 8 of Beyond Evil begins with Jin Muk being taken to the police station. Only, the road to arrest him has been anything but easy. Ju Wan handcuffs himself to Dong Sik until the latter finally reveals Jin Muk is the one responsible. In the wake of our killer being taken away, Ju Wan is approached by a woman claiming to be Bang Ju Xin's sister. She frantically asks him about the fingers, but Ju Wan doesn't have any answers. 
In the morning, the superintendent watches the news carefully and decides to interfere with the investigation. Specifically, he wants him transferred across to his jurisdiction. Quan Hayok shows up and reveals that the bodies they found were both choked out, which seems to link to being the same killer. The body out in the reed fields is definitely confirmed to be Jun Hua too, and for now, they decide to set out and protect Ju Wan as best they can. Well, Dong Sik isn't protected, especially when he finds out these girls may well have been killed by suffocation and major organ failure. Jin Muk buried his victims underground in bags, so they slowly died. Eventually Jin Muk gives up the location of Min Yun, is brought to the station and cremated. Jai Hoon is beside himself with grief and eventually collapses on the ground in shock. Jin Muk requests to speak to Dong Sik personally, bringing this angry officer back into the interrogation room. He completely ignores Jin Muk though, focusing on the computer, especially given they need to type and follow Korean laws. As Dong Sik starts to load up the report, Jin Muk claims that Min Yun was a noisy wench, and he had enough. Now we cut back in time and see him choking out all of his victims. Dong Sik eventually turns the tables and asks about Jin Muk's past. Specifically, how Min Yun wasn't actually his real daughter. Flashes from the past come back as Min Yun decides to get a paternity test. This causes Jin Muk to launch himself across the table and straight at Dong Sik's throat. Ju Wan is shocked and eventually decides to book a period of absence. At the same time, Ying Zhe draws his dear at home on the sketch pad. While he does, his mother shows and suggests he draw Min Yun. After a big fight with his mother, Ying Zhe does receive some good news from Jie Yi, who phones and congratulates him for his good work. Ju Wan catches up with Dong Sik and questions his attitude. He especially wants to know why he wasn't enraged after what happened. Dong Sik shrugs it off though, and claims being angry doesn't get you anywhere. Eventually Ju Wan admits that he's down by the docks, right where Dong Sik is, because he's trying to find Min Yun's birth mother. Apparently she was an associate of Jun Hua too, and given she was in the same line of business, it gives Jin Muk a reason for killing. Dong Sik and Ju Wan eventually head back to the police station and ask Jin Muk about the events from that night. Specifically, they show a paternity test showing that he's definitely not Min Yun's father. Jin Muk is shocked, and even more so when he finds out Mai Hai didn't actually die that day. What these two are doing is illegal of course, but it's also done so to rile up Jin Muk and make him talk. This seems to do the trick, as Jin Muk eventually admits that he didn't kill Yu Yin all those years ago, he does, however, know where the victims are buried. He suddenly leans forward and whispers to Dong Sik, telling him he knows he's the one who put the fingers out the front of the supermarket. Despite this chilling statement, Jin Muk gives up the location Jie Yi's back garden. When police arrive and begin excavating, they find skeletal remains along with Jie Yi's mother's hairpin. Although they haven't done a DNA test, all the skeletal remains point toward the victims being in their 30s and 40s. None of them are Yu Yin. Unfortunately, there's still no closure for Dong Sik yet. Even worse, word reaches Dong Sik and Ju Wan from the prison cell holding Jin Muk. He's dead, with blood lining the floor and the walls. Up on the wall, however, is a message claiming he didn't kill Yu. Episode 9 of Beyond Evil begins with Ju Wan admitting his part in the sting operation. He gives his statement, including an impassioned plea, to punish him for his role in all this. With the investigation closed for now, Ju Wan instead goes completely off the grid. Dong Sik meanwhile watches old footage of Jin Muk. As he does, he realizes there may well be a clue underground, prompting Dong Sik to smash up the floor with a sledgehammer. He's haunted by what's happened in the past, and desperate for closure. With Jin Muk dead now, it seems he's not going to find it. The day draws on and Dong Sik heads out on patrol with Jai Hoon. Together, they uncover another gambling run in a touch of deja vu to the first episode. And just like that chapter, Dong Sik brings the ladies in for questioning. Ju Wan returns too, and introduces himself to the others. He locks the doors this time, and comments how nothing really changes. Meanwhile, Jie Yi turns herself into the police department. At the main station, she arrives voluntarily to confirm she was near Munju police station early in the morning. In fact, she was actually on her way to killing Jin Muk. The date is November 10th too, which is the date Jin Muk was actually killed in prison. Only, the death itself was allegedly suicide thanks to a fishing line, so it seems she's in the clear for now. With this interesting turn of events, Ju Wan decides to stay in Nanyang for the time being. His father isn't exactly pleased at this, and even more so, when the superintendent sees footage of Jie Yi has cropped up. This footage inevitably prompts all the officers to feel uneasy, that evening when they're over at Jie Yi's butcher shop. 
As they all sit down to eat, Jai Hua asks Dong Sik outright whether he was aware of Jie Yi arriving at the station. He smirks, telling her it would be great if he did, because he'd killed Jin Muk himself. On the back of this, Dong Sik shows the others the footage of Jin Muk and, specifically, the segments involving him casually mentioning construction. This could be a clue, but then again it may not be. Either way, Ying Zhe is the one who may have uncovered something. Given Jin Muk's desire to bury his victims, Dong Sik tries to work out if the site in general is at his hideout. One thing leads to another, and the group head down to the farmland and begin a wide search, digging frantically to try and find any possible bodies. While they dig, it's Jai Hoon who once again uncovers a skeleton. This is enough for Chang Jin to be brought to the station for questioning. He claims he can't remember Jin Muk. While Jai Hua interviews him, a text message comes in confirming more bodies have been found. Unfortunately, none of them seem to be in their 20s so it doesn't seem like Yu Yin is there. In a cruel sense of irony, Jin Muk's will confirms that Dong Sik gets to take over all of his property. Dong Sik visits his mother in hospital and hears her talking about construction work and the boiler. She immediately starts acting hysterically, claiming her children are shivering with cold. On the back of this statement, Dong Sik immediately heads into his basement and checks near the boiler. Inside the wall he finds Yu Yin's ring and realizes, to his shock, that she was there this whole time. Meanwhile, Ju Wen follows Chief Nam as he shows up at the butchers. He questions her about the station, and, more specifically, how she saw him that night. It turns out he too was at the police station around the same time as Jin Muk's murder. It's clear Jie Yi is afraid of him as he stares menacingly into her eyes. As she asks whether he killed Jin Muk, he's suddenly arrested for aiding and abetting by two officers who show up. Just before phoning the police, Dong Sik receives a call from Jai Hua confirming that Chief Nam has been arrested. Not only do they find the fishing line in his drawer, they also find documents too. Is Chief Nam really the one responsible for killing Yu Yin? Well, as the episode closes out we see someone planting everything in Chief Nam's safe. And that someone... We begin episode 10 of Beyond Evil in December 2020. We're in Busan as Ju Wan visits Quan Hayok. He tells Ju Wan he won't be able to win against Dong Sik, especially given how smart he is, and offers to take over for him. Ju Wan, however, rejects this and instead decides he'll just have to be reborn. Heading down to the docks, he notices Jie Yi cutting fish. However, Chief Nam arrives trying to find her. Jie Yi sees him approach and quickly leaves. Ju Wan sees the chief from afar and immediately looks suspicious. When he heads back to his hotel room, Ju Wan receives a message confirming they have footage of Chief Nam. This happens to be the moments from the night Jin Muk died. Meanwhile, the police officers arrive at Dong Sik's basement and begin taking photos and examining the crime scene. Dong Sik, however, is back at the police station talking to Chief Nam. With tears in his eyes, he talks about how the hope of finding his daughter alive has completely vanished. It's a harrowing and heart-wrenching conversation, when that sees Dong Sik eventually push back Nam's sympathetic hand. He looks at his boss and asks Nam about Jin Muk's suicide. Specifically, he asks outright whether he's the one responsible. He claims he's not, as Dong Sik leaves. Back at the butchers, Jie Yi starts making food for everyone as footage from the offices comes in, courtesy of Jai Hua. It's still not clear who planted the evidence, for them anyway, we know it's Ju Wan, but it also means this officer is trying to attract attention and cause a scene. As Dong Sik watches the CCTV footage of the station, he notices Ju Wan watching the camera and smiling, instantly realizing what this means. Dong Sik shows up at Ju Wan's place and asks him about the fishing line. However, Ju Wan turns it around and reminds him of his earlier statement, Manyang people stick together. Well, Ju Wan brings up the various different people who could be responsible, including Jie Yi and the chief. Dong Sik's home and family ties with all the officers seem to have blinded him, at least according to Ju Wan anyway. Meanwhile, Ying Zhe finds himself struggling. As he stands in the bathroom, he sees visions of Yu Yin, demanding she stick around. However, she does turn and walk away, allowing Ying Zhe to breathe a sigh of relief. His mother shows up at the station and notices her son has numerous pictures of a doe he's still sketching. On the back of this, she approaches Chang Jin Li and goes for dinner, asking him about medication and intending to try and help Ying Zhe. Dong Sik heads off and visits Jie Yi, asking what she saw that night at the station. She hesitates, struggling with the truth. She doubts whether it's really Nam, as Dong Sik learns what she does. With Nam released from custody, he tries ringing him, but the chief hangs up. 
Both Dong Sik and Ju Won follow Chief Nam. The latter has a location tracker on his phone, but unfortunately loses signal when Nam gets in a taxi. Eventually he does find it, though when the tracker reappears at Manju police station. Dong Sik meanwhile, rings his number, but he doesn't pick up. This search obviously brings Ju Won before Kai Huan, who sits in the car with Ju Won, and begs him to stop investigating. Given it's a closed case, he tells Ju Won to stop prying so much into this. Well, that's not suspicious. Meanwhile, Dong Sik receives some damning news from forensics. It turns out Yu Yin's neck wasn't actually broken, so she wasn't strangled. In fact, the bone breaks and fractures seem to hint toward being run over multiple times. When Dong Sik finds out and checks the bones himself, he's distraught. Unfortunately, this also coincides with what Jin Muk mentioned regarding him not killing Yu Yin. Could we have a second killer on our hands? And is it Chief Nam? Well, as we cut to Chief Nam, he's blindsided at a scrapyard. Why was he even there? And attacked by an unknown culprit. This seems to be our killer, as Ju Won charges off and chases the SUV holding Chief Nam. He rings Dong Sik and lets him know too, as he drives down. While he speeds off, Dong Sik tells him to be careful, and even calls Ju Won his partner. Unfortunately, when they get there, they're too late. Chief Nam. Episode 11 of Beyond Evil begins in January 2003. Chief Nam heads in to pay his respects to Yu Yin. He apologizes to Dong Sik after being unable to find his sister. Dong Sik sobs, telling Nam that he's struggling to breathe and embracing his elder. This parallels to today, as Dong Sik and Ju Won both paid their respects to Chief Nam. Poor Dong Sik has been through the wars, but he remembers Nam's words from 2018, telling him to get up and keep fighting. All our officers gather together at the butchers, where Jai Hua pours a drink for him. Dong Sik and Yung Zhou aren't there though, given they're over at Nam's house helping to sort out their belongings. The night goes well, although Gilgo takes off midway through. After the meal, Ju Won catches up with Jie Yi and apologizes for the email sent. He regrets not being able to do more for her, but eventually thanks her for the meal and walks away. In the morning, Ju Won heads down to the shore, where he finds Ying Zhou popping pills and staring at the ocean. Ju Won asks about the pills, but he refuses to disclose what's going on. As they talk together, Ju Won admits it's his fault for Nam passing, and that he's the one who put him in danger. Ying Zhe brings up the pain of regret, and empathizes with him, knowing what it's like to blame yourself. He then walks away, leaving Ju Won with a lot to think out. He also gives Ju Won instructions to head further down the road. There, Dong Sik happens to be fishing. He asks for the detective's help, determined to try and solve Nam's murder. As they talk, Ju Won brings up the two most likely suspects, Guang Yong and Gilgo. Unfortunately both of them lied about heading to the station to see a friend which makes them very suspicious. Deciding to get back to basics, the team work together to track down both officers and figure out what they may be hiding. Jie Yi eventually tracks down Guang Yong at the station, is talking to a shadowy man in the hallway. He seems to receive some bad news though, prompting him to double over in despair. It turns out he's there regarding an interview, but it was bad news. This explains what he was up to. Meanwhile, Ying Zhe starts to trace the call logs at the station and realizes that one links to the chief superintendent. When his mother calls, fussing over him and making plans, Ying Zhe becomes impatient and eventually throws his pills in the bin. Speaking of which, Zhu Wan heads back to see his father at his office. It turns out Gilgo asked to speak to him that night regarding the serial murders. Apparently he made a delivery that night too, under instructions from the superintendent. That man of course, being Ju Won's father. According to Kai Huan though, he has no knowledge of this at all. In fact, Nam then came over and visited the boss afterwards, asking about Gilgo. He mentions the forensics report, asking if he got rid of it 21 years ago. Kai Huan eventually confronted him, telling Nam to leave. However, something doesn't add up here. In the hallway he pretended not to know who Gilgo was but of course that's a lie. Kai Huan brushes this accusation aside, claiming not to know what this forensic report is. Ju Wan feeds the news back to Dong Sik though, who receives more news about Gilgo. Apparently that night no parking signs were placed in front of the police station to make sure dashcam footage didn't pick up the culprit. On top of that, Gilgo also visited Nam that night. The group cornered Gilgo and demand the truth. He eventually tells them he head into the station that night because he was concerned for Nam's well-being. Once at the cell, Nam mentions the forensics report from 21 years ago, the same one we've been hearing about. The forensics came back clean as it seems like someone cleaned the guitar pick perfectly. 
Because of this, Nam then went after Dong Sik. In fact, they literally arrested Dog Sik just because the pick belonged to him. The report he was ordered to get rid of is regarding the guitar pick itself, especially since the entire thing seems to be fabricated. However, it turns out someone else met Nam that night. That person. Chi Fing. He not only told Gil Go to be careful that night, he also threatened Gil Go too, telling him to be quiet if he wants to live. In the station, Nam questioned Ying and asked outright whether he was responsible for the fishing line incident. Apparently they talked about the good old days. Only, Ju Wen is wise to this, and had Nam's words translated. It turns out the conversation was actually regarding Jin Muk and asking whether Nam was next in line to be killed. And now we see the truth. The camera pans out to show Chang Jin examining footage on his computer. As he stands up, Chang Jin angrily smashes the vase with his king. The next scene shows him removing his mask down by the docks, and seems to hint that he's the one responsible. However, Yingzhi and Dong Sik both follow Councilwoman Du, asking outright whether she's the one responsible. It turns out she has two phones too, but refuses to answer her incoming call. Instead, Dong Sik turns his attention to Yingzhi, calling him a punk and asking outright just what he's hiding. Now we cut back to the 15th October 2000. Yu Yin is desperate for help, but unfortunately Yingzhi ran her over. When he did, Councilwoman Du and Chang Jin both showed up and noticed the mess in the room. Episode 12 of Beyond Evil begins in February 1995. Chang Jin looks over a new apartment block being built and comments on his past, specifically how he always had plans to make it big. When a man arrives, questioning him about Russians and the nightclub trade, Chang Jin beats him down and reiterates that he's not in the business anymore. Back in the present, it turns out Chang Jin's apartment construction has ended up as a matter of make or break, with the business hanging precariously by a thread. Director Kim has cold feet about the Munju project, but Chang Jin simply tells him to get out. When he leaves, Chang Jin receives the email from himself which is obviously someone posing as him online. With the footage of the jail cell, Chang Jin hurriedly leaves in his car. Meanwhile, Dong Se questions Ying Zhe over what happened to Yu Yin in the past. Now he finally opens up and admits he's recognized the number on his mother burner phone for the last 20 years. Yingzhi knows who it belongs to, but can't remember the specifics of the event with Yu Yin that night. With a signed medical consent form, it seems like Yingzhi actually signed this without being aware of it. As Yingzhi starts to panic, Dong Sik and Ju Wen phone an ambulance to pick him up. On the back of this incident, Ju Wen questions whether Dong Sik is actually ready for this investigation or not. As they leave, Chang Jin happens to be watching in his car, crouched down and suspiciously eyeing them both as this unfolds. Meanwhile, Quan Hayok speaks to Kai Huan about the evidence from the past. Specifically, he brings up the guitar pick report that's been a big focal point in the past. Specifically, they discuss whether someone had this destroyed. Could this someone have been Kai Huan? Well, if he is responsible he has one hack of a poker face and doesn't let on. This report seems to be what links Jin Muk and Chief Nam's deaths together too, with Dong Sik believing that it could be the guitar pick itself that's cause for concern here. It seems like someone planted the guitar pick next to the dead body. The attention soon turns to indiscretions from that night, including a new security camera installed across the way. Interestingly, that building is owned by JL Construction. JL Construction then links back to Chang Jin. This certainly holds weight, especially when Dong Sik notices a familiar registration plate on a car nearby. This, of course, matches Chang Jin's vehicle from the night before. Now they realize that Chang Jin is involved. Well, Councilwoman Du arrives with her prized bodyguard Obok, who waits outside the room. Du confirms to him that Yingzhe can't remember anything from that night, and reassures him that their secret is safe for now. As the attention turns to the burner phone, we cut back in time to the day Sang Bei died. This phone was buzzing non-stop, prompting Chang Jin to cave and tell the Councilwoman to answer it. The call is from Gilgu, regarding the, the guitar pick report. It's here she learns that Chief Nam has figured out the truth. Because of this, she was about to be blamed for everything that's happened. However, Chang Jin interjects and asks for her phone, where Hei Wen opens up and admits that she's the one who fabricated everything, and actually planted the pick herself. The pendulum swings again, this time toward Yingxia as Chang Jin warns that her son is a ticking time bomb, and could destroy everything they've built to hide all this time. Yingxia leaves Hansong Mental Hospital and begins wandering down the street. There, he finds himself right in front of Ju Wen's car. 
flashes of that deer come back again, which eventually sees Ju Won pick the amnesia-stricken Yingzhe up and bring him on. Yingzhe admits Hattie can't remember anything, but Ju Won is sure there's something more to his story. In fact, he encourages Yingzhe to try and remember everything about his past, and tell Dong Sik the truth. While he goes on a trip down memory lane to Dong Sik's basement, Ju Won shows up at the butchers, where everyone from the substation and Jie Yi are gathered together. With a level-headed approach, the group go over the incident involving Yu Yi in that night. They believe she was hit head-on by a car going over 45 km per hour, and one that didn't slow down either. After this, Ju Won mentions to Dong Sik about dropping Ying Zhou off at the basement. Although he's not exactly happy about it, Ju Won does convince him it's a good thing, especially if it means getting his memories back and helping them get some closure. The attention soon turns to the buildings in the area, and specifically why the ownership changed hands in 2020 between Councilwoman Du and Changjin. It certainly seems suspicious, and when you add in the wildcard factor of Gang Jia too, it seems like all of this is connected. Dong Sik goes straight for Gilgu, questioning him over the call in the past. He claims he didn't know why Nam was in the scrapyard, and promises all he did was send a message. According to him, he didn't do anything else beyond that. However, the attention quickly turns to that fateful night back in October 2000. It's here Gilgu gave Hei Won the original report for the guitar pick and received a fake one from her. This fabricated report is what he gave Chief Nam, meaning the original is still out there and could actually hold the evidence they need. That evidence could even point to Yingzhe's DNA being on the pick, which would explain why Councilwoman Du has been so adamant about covering everything up. Dong Sik grabs his sledgehammer and immediately confronts Yingzhe in the basement about this. Dong Sik asks outright about the night of the car accident. Yingzhe thinks hard and claims he definitely hit a deer. He continues to mention how he wasn't the one who killed her. Dong Sik loses his patience though and screams at him, asking for answers. And now, it seems, we're going to get some. Yingzhe's memory is jog, and he remembers talking to Yu Yin while fingering the guitar pick. During that night, Yingzhe held the guitar pick and asked Yu Yin to head inside and break the news about their relationship. Instead, Yu Yin brings up the burner phone and what her mother is hiding, telling him she should come clean. As Yu Yin starts walking away, Yingzhe heads inside and pops some pills, drinking alcohol to obscure his inhibitions. Unfortunately, in his drunken state, Yingzhe decided to drive off in search of Yu Yin. Only, Yu Yin happened to be on the floor already collapsed. Yingzhe slammed on the brakes, but it was too late, he ran her over completely and dropped the pick on the floor. With Yingzhe distraught and with tears streaming down his face, Dong Sik phones Ju Won and invites him over. Ju Won is determined to apprehend Yingzhe and see justice, but Dong Sik is not so sure this is the right move. In fact, midway through talking about trust, they're interrupted by an emergency message. Ju Won's father has now become the most important person in the police force, thanks to a new promotion. As Dong Sik claps and bows before a shock Ju Won, we jump back in time once more. This time we see a car plow straight into Yu Yin and knock her down. The driver of said car. None other than Superintendent Kai. Episode 13 of Beyond Evil begins on the 14th October 2000. Kai Huan arrives to see Councilwoman Du and Shang Jin. Both of them are drinking, but he's not in the mood to join them. At least not to begin with anyway. Not wanting to seem too rude, Du eventually convinces him to have one drink with them. While they sit together, Chang Jin admits that he likes Jai Hua and wants to marry her. Back in the present, Jai Hua watches from afar as Chang Jin shows up at the parking lot. He watches Kai Huan leave in his car, struggling to speak to him. He's mad they're not together, and after cursing in Russian, Jai Hua decides to check her ex's phone log. Meanwhile, the big revelation about a second car being involved in Yu Yin's murder rings through. Yingzhe confirms as much, and that seems to be why Dong Sik didn't kill him that night. He confessed to killing the girl, but not to actually running her down while she's standing. Right on the back of this, the terrible threesome are now prime suspects it seems, especially when Jai Hua pulls up Chang Jin's phone records. Chang Jin has been in contact with the superintendent and Hei Won too. Now it becomes clear to these detectives that the superintendent is the real ringleader involved in all this, meaning Ju Won is in a difficult position given that's his father. Ju Won outright admits her doesn't trust anyone, and right now, he's not so sure what to believe. Meanwhile, Yingzhe heads home and speaks to his mother, admitting that he remembers everything from that night. Du gave money to Chang Jin to help clean up the mess. This explains why he showed up at the crime scene, and why Du is indebted to him. She used the pretense of their business to essentially blackmail him into showing up. 
After sending Yu Yin to a mental institute, he left Chang Jin at the crime scene to deal with Yu Yin. But did he really? That remains to be seen. Back in the present, it turns out Dong Sik has kept Ying Zhe alive to find out who really killed Yu Yin. Well, as we already know it's actually Kai Guan. However, our protagonists aren't aware of this. Dong Sik tasks Ying Zhe with confronting his mother, conspiring with him to plant seeds of doubt within Councilwoman Du's mind. Specifically he tells her that there have been secret meetings without her. Ju Wan heads home and speaks to his father about the current situation with the guitar pick. He plays a dangerous game, deciding to bring up a lot of dirt about the past, including Station Chief Ying accepting bribes. His father's face drops, and even more so during a later chat with Chiu Man himself. Under Kai Huan's orders, he was told to destroy the CCTV footage from the night Jin Muk was killed. Only, he didn't. Despite Kai Huan deciding to use Nam as a scapegoat to take the fall, in reality Ying played Kai Huan and kept filming from the cell. Chang Jin had in that night and handed over the wire to make Jin Muk commit suicide. All of this was then sent by email to CHANG0 Jin by Chiu Man. Meanwhile, Ju Wan and Dong Sik talk outside the station about his father being involved. In fact, Dong Sik asks outright if he's going to be okay. It's a big moment for their relationship, including the trust they now feel for one another after everything they've been through. Ju Wan eventually decides to talk to that reporter from earlier in the season. He goes one step further too, and decides to give him a tip-off about bribery inside the police station. Meanwhile, Kai Huan asks to meet Dong Sik personally. When the latter shows up, he offers Dong Sik a job. It's a pretty big curveball, and one that sees Dong Sik transfer to internal investigations. He's also going to be working directly with Kai Huan. Holding out his hand, Dong Sik deliberates over whether to shake it or not. We then cut forward a week later. Ying Zhe has decided to accept whatever punishment is coming his way. As he agrees to this, we then cut to the hearing of Commissioner General Han. Only, Ju Wan happens to be there in attendance too, watching his father take the oath. The news article breaks right on time, with the officials sharing this damning report with him. Within these documents are claims that he's been taking bribes, complete with pictures and a signature. In front of everyone, he tells them all this was a debt from Yun, and has been dealt with internally. Now Ju Wan realizes that his father is definitely deceptive and going to get away scot-free. Dong Sik suddenly shows up with his badge though, confirming he's part of Kai Huan's team, and asks to be let in. He immediately brings up an arrest without a warrant issue. Storming across the room, he grabs Ju Wan and arrests him in front of everyone for what happened with Jun Hua. As handcuffs are put on him, the pair turn simultaneously and look toward Kai Huan, as the episode comes to- Episode 14 of Beyond Evil, begins on the 15th October 2000. Kai Huan heads home and confronts his wife, and Ju Wan's mother. He takes out his frustrations on her, and tells her to stay in a mental institute until she dies. As nurses arrive to take her away, Kai Huan promises to keep Ju Wan safe. Now we cut back, and see Ju Wan in handcuffs. It turns out it was actually Ju Wan's idea all along. Given Kai Huan strives for perfection, seeing his son like this will catch Kai Huan completely off guard. Dong Sik warned Ju Wan before this, that it could destroy and ruin his reputation. Ju Wan doesn't care. Dong Sik eventually told Ju Wan to remain silent while this investigation is going on. Back in the present and predictably Ju Wan does no such thing. In the police station he speaks up and admits to the charges he faces. With little other choice, Dong Sik makes the decision to suspend Ju Wan from his role. In fact, Ju Wan heads straight for Kai Huan's office and admits that he's in trouble. His father simply tells him to leave. Meanwhile, Ying Zhe and his mother meet Chang Jin in the middle of the night. They question him over killing Jin Muk, and now the truth is revealed. It turns out while Chang Jin was moving Yu Yin's car, Jin Muk snuck out the bushes and grabbed the dead body of Yu Yin, burying her in Dong Sik's basement. As he says the words, Ying Zhe shows off his phone which is currently on a call to Dong Sik. He's been listening this whole time. Just before Chang Jin is taken away, he mentions a secret that he and Hei Wan share together. Her face turns ghostly white as she's clearly hiding something. Quite what though, remains to be seen. Chang Jin is brought in for questioning regarding his confessions on the phone. Given he was hypothetical, he's not completely incriminated for now. However, he does start squirming when he's asked about the construction trade and his ties to both councilwoman, Du and Kai Huan. Dong Sik listens from the other room intently and realizes that this trio have known each other for 21 years. For now, Chang Jin is let go, but Ying follows him outside. 
He pats the man on the shoulder and chuckles, telling Chang Jin he'll be seeing him soon. As Chang Jin takes the keys back for his car, he receives a message reading one hour later, which is in reference to the past incident with Kai Huan and the drinking. In his car, Dong Six hails Chang Jin who tries speeding away and losing him. Jai Hua is there for the ride, and this unfortunately leads to the pair crashing in the middle of the intersection. It's not a bad crash, but it is enough to stop them in their tracks. Meanwhile, Jie Yi follows Kai Huan, but gets stopped at a DUI station along the way. This chase was all Ju Wan's idea too, as he orchestrated the meet between Chang Jin and Kai Huan. As they step into the latter's car they begin talking. It turns out Chang Jin was there, when Kai Huan originally hit Yu Yin, and then circled back when Councilwoman Du rang. Anyway, in the middle of the night the pair discuss Yu Yin's murder. It turns out he's actually bugged Kai Huan's car, and listens to everything as Chang Jin and Kai Huan discuss taking care of Yin like they did Chief Nam. Just before they leave, Chang Jin tells Kai Huan not to answer any calls from Councilwoman, Du and to keep things between them. To complicate matters, Jin Muk even saw him hit Yu Yin too. As rain pours down outside, Ju Wan leaves his car and walks purposefully up toward Kai Huan and Chang. Episode 15 of Beyond Evil begins with Ju Wan learning the truth about his father. He hurriedly leaves his car, snatching up a golf club and walking purposefully through the rain. The reason for this comes from more of the conversation left out last episode. It turns out Kai Huan called his son pathetic and admitted that he would get rid of him if he ended up as a mistake. It's a horrible thing to say about your own flesh and blood, and something that sees Ju Wan snap. As he stands in the rain he starts chuckling a defense mechanism to handle the pain similar to that used by Dong Sik earlier in the season. Ju Wan heads over to Dong Sik's place, devastated by what he's just heard. Silently, he plays the audio footage he's captured from the car. Ju Wan grabs Dong Sik's shoulder and promises to find him and use himself as bait to trap his own father. Ju Wan pleads with Dong Sik to help stop this, dropping to his knees and pleading, deciding to be tormented. We then skip forward in time slightly. Councilwoman Du decides against quitting the mayorship and greedily settles on pushing her career forward. Yingzha confronts her though, until the truth about the deer comes clear. When Yingzha was younger he used to lock the kid in his father's deer farm. This despicable woman decided to wipe her hands of Yingzha and disregard herself as his mother. As she walks away, Yingzha is left shot. Dong Sik messages Ju Wan and invites him out to eat. The respect these two have for each other now, compared to the early episodes in the season, is really great to see. The pair eat their noodles, after all, Ju Wan needs his strength for that fiery pit he'll be descending down soon at least according to Dong Sik anyway. Ju Wan eventually heads over and confronts his father, playing the audio file to him. Kai Huan strikes the table in anger. With bloodied knuckles he grabs Ju Wan by the scruff of his neck and challenges his son. Ju Wan has his number though, and strikes a deal to make him commissioner general. In doing so, that will allow Ju Wan to rise up the ranks himself. After shaking hands, Ju Wan asks to be reinstated at the station. Only, this is obviously part of that aforementioned trap, given it shows him backpedaling on everything he told the hearing. Ying requests a meeting with Chang Jin down by the docks. With a pipe in hand, and on the back of a particularly unpleasant meeting with Du, he looks set to kill Ying. Only, Dong Sik suddenly shows up and shouts out nice shot. When Chang Jin leaves, Dong Sik informs Ying that he's just saved his life. Well, Ju Wan shows up next, and escorts Chang Jin down to the station. There, Ju Wan and Dong Sik play good cop bad cop while they investigate Chang Jin. They ask him about that fateful night Jin Muk died, where the truth is revealed. He mentions Councilwoman Du and how he didn't need her, which seems to hint that this pair left her out of their grand plans, at least according to Chang Jin. His mention of Yingzha being locked up though is enough to spur the officers into action. When they arrive at Du's house, they learn the truth that she's taken him to the institute. News breaks that Kai Huan has now been made the commissioner general. He's obviously beaming, but Ju Wan is ready to strike. Before that though, he receives a message from Yun telling him to meet alone as he has news that can be helpful. The pair split up, with Dong Sik heading for Yingzha and Ju Wan going for Yun. He heads into the building alone, although Jai Hua is not happy with this arrangement, and eventually decides to head in. Dong Sik Tu changes his mind and heads up to the housing area. When Ju Wan walks out the house though, his hands are covered in blood, and he claims Ying is dead. In fact, he even tells Dong Sik that he thinks he killed him. As he and Ju Wan stare at one another, the episode comes to a cl Episode 16 of Beyond Evil begins with Chang Jin arriving at Kai Huan's house and confronting him. 
In fact, it's here Kai Huan comes clean and admits that their conversation was recorded. In order to bait Ju Wen, they decide to use Ying as their tool. Now we skip forward and see it was Chang Jin who killed Ying. He stabbed the man in the neck and left him in a bloody heat by the bath. Ju Wen had in alone and found the superintendent bleeding out. In his dying breath he tried to say something, but failed to do so. With blood staining his hands, Ju Wen also noticed the knife on the ground along with a phone, blinking with a message asking Dong Sik to show up. Now it becomes clear that Dong Sik was the intended target here. Now we skip forward to the police station during present time. Dong Sik questions just why Ju Wen had in the house instead of waiting for. Well, it turns out he didn't want to get framed so took a bullet for Dong Sik. When Dong Sik finds out, he tells Ju Wen he's going to do everything he can to make sure he doesn't go down for this. Outside in the hallway, Jai Hua confronts Dong Sik, knowing it was him who placed Min Ying's fingers outside the shop. Asking just what he's hiding, Dong Sik comes clean and reveals that Kai Huan was the one who killed Yu Yin all those years ago. After talking, Dong Sik shows up at Yu Wen's place, cracking a joke about showing unannounced. This is, of course, a running gag across the show about bursting into houses without consent. Anyway, Dong Sik wants his help for their upcoming hunt. This hunt is clearly designed to take down both Chang Jin and Kai Huan, who continue to scheme and work out how to deal with Ying's death. Kai Huan wants to spin this as a suicide, especially if there's no evidence to back the claims up. Suddenly, Jai Hua shows up to bring Chang Jin down to the station. He refuses to answer her questions, including who he was on the phone to and whether he killed Yun. Well, the video footage from the lake shows that he clearly wanted to kill Yun, save for Dong Sik's interjection. In fact, Dong Sik heads down to see Councilwoman Du, talking to her about Chang Jin and their changing fates. Specifically, he mentions how Yu Yin's death has changed everything. Dong Sik blows the lid wide open on this, admitting to her that there was someone else involved that hit Yu Yin before her son did. This is enough to spark the flames of doubt, as she hurriedly phones Secretary Chang. Meanwhile, Ju Wen arrives at the hospital to help Ying Zhe. In fact, Jie Yi happens to be in the ambulance at the time, and they speed away from the hospital before Ju's helpers can get to him. Out in the open, he asks Ying Zhe to do the right thing and turn himself in. Instead, he asks Ju Wen to arrest him for concealing evidence relating to Yu Yin's death. As everything starts to spiral out of control, Ju Wen tells Prosecutor Quan to let go of the rotten rope he's clinging to. If he's not careful, this is going to snap. With Du in custody, she decides to plead the fifth and remain silent. While she does, Dong Sik chimes in and mentions how Chang Jin and Kai Huan have both been playing her all this time. He mentions the burner phone, with corroborated evidence from Gil Gu to throw her into the firing line for the incident involving the fake rope. Eventually Dong Sik brings the situation round to Jin Muk, who apparently asked for the key to the deer farm, and blackmailed her over the guitar pick. He was the one who put the pick at the crime scene in a bid to frame Ying Zhe. In fact, Du knew all about Jin Muk's killings, but was forced to keep quiet all this time. Ying Zhe, however doesn't seem to be part of this blackmailed web, save for being the one who ran over Yu Yin. When he figures out his own mother covered all this up, he's overcome with grief. Approaching the glass at the station, he apologizes profusely to Dong Sik, but asks for a favor. That favor happens to be, Du telling them the truth about Jin Muk and Chief Nam. If the truth is revealed that she's been covering all this up, he promises to slit his own throat. This is enough for Du to crack and open up, admitting that she showed the text message to Chang Jin. She also gives Kai Huan's name too. This is enough for Ju Wan to issue a warrant against her and Chang Jin. Both of these will obviously incriminate Kai Huan given his intimate ties with them both. Based on this, and Kai Huan's constant bickering, Prosecutor Quan decides to sever ties with Kai Huan. With the arrest warrants in place, Chang Jin is kept in the same cell that Jin Muk died in. Only, in the middle of the night Dong Sik sneaks in and grabs Chang Jin round the neck. Chang Jin immediately claims that Kai Huan was the real ringleader in everything that's happened. These confessions, coupled with Ju Wen's recording, are enough for him to put a gun to his head and contemplate suicide. This in itself is ironic given Kai Huan's insistence that suicide is the cowardly way out. Dong Sik shows up too, setting up a tense standoff between these three characters. Eventually this sees Kai Huan arrested, kept in handcuffs for his role in all this. With Kai Huan's face covered, he's escorted out by Jai Huan. While he leaves, Ju Wen decides to quit the force and accept his punishment. Dong Sik refuses to allow this, though and tells him the guilty should be the ones who are punished. 
Dong Sik turns the tables and decides that Ju Won should arrest him for obstructing the crime scene. If Ju Won doesn't arrest him, Dong Sik will never turn himself in. This is the moment. The moment Ju Won has been waiting for since the first episode. As he puts the handcuffs on, you can see the regret and pain in Ju Won's face. He even bows to his colleague in this really emotional moment. Kai Huan is given 20 years imprisonment, while Councilwoman Du receives 9 years. Ying Zhe, meanwhile, is given 3 years in jail. Dong Sik has a year in prison with 2 years on probation after. Ju Won, however, is acquitted thanks to his role in stopping the serial murders. We then cut forward to February 2022. Ju Won pays his respects to Yu Yin by her grave and promises to visit her again. Ju Won returns to town, where he finds Jie Yi out with a carton of eggs. She invites him in for food after a quick joke about throwing eggs. Ju Won happens to be working in a juvenile center now, but he's back to pay a visit to everyone. There, he inevitably runs into Dong Sik who invites Ju Won inside for food. As they say their goodbyes, Dong Sik and Ju Won both exchange smiles. Genuine smiles that hint at a newfound respect from the The ending of last episode. What an incredible drama, and an incredible finale too. Beyond Evil bows out with an eye on perfect final episode that wraps everything up and solidifies this Korean drama as one of the best shows of 2021. There are so many standout moments here that it's hard to pick out a few. The show has twisted and turned through this murder mystery in a really gripping and compelling way, but back that up with some incredible character development too. Both Dong Sik and Ju Won have gone through quite the ride over these 16 episodes, with the end shots of this chapter mirroring that scene in episode 1. The only difference here is in the emotion conveyed. This evolving emotion and respect these two detectives have for one another is ultimately what's made the ride up until this point so satisfying. Seeing Ju Won really struggling to arrest Dong Sik, especially given it is exactly what's been driving this character forward all this time, was really heart-wrenching. In fact, this entire scene is enveloped in so much emotion that it's hard not to have tears in your eyes. That's to say nothing of the final shot too, which finally sees Dong Sik and Ju Won at peace regarding what's happened and finally ready to move forward with their lives. The actual case itself has been just as interesting, though in seeing the final pieces all come together in the police station was incredibly satisfying. Kai Huan, Chang Jin and Du all get what they deserve in the end, with Ying Zhe's lesson ultimately being not to drink and drive. Overall, Beyond Evil has been an amazing drama, and easily one of the best small screen efforts of 2021. For all those who reached out and recommended I cover this one, thank you. This show has been an incredible watch, and will undoubtedly be a tough one to beat for best drama of 2021.